let's get started then. So our question, uh, question that we've been pursuing now for uh, almost three weeks is this idea of um, why are relationships so different in how they unfold? Why are relationships so variable in the experiences that they create for us, sometimes so wonderful, sometimes so difficult, even tragic? Why do they vary so much? And many of the answers that psychologists have turned to have focus specifically on what seems to be special within our relationships, which is that we have a certain kind of chemistry, or you sort of get me in a certain way, or uh, we have a, a, a way of communicating that makes us feel strong and complete and whole. And we'll see next week, especially, and then after the midterm exam, uh, how the nature of interpersonal processes contributes to the development of our relationships and the maintenance of our relationships. But one really good answer, a different answer to why relationships vary so much, is that the people vary so much. It's not necessarily the way they come together, the way that they talk, but who they are as they enter the very relationship from the beginning. Right? So who are you and who are your partner before we even get to the point of where we contemplate and think about and try to understand what you're telling each other? Who you are as individuals may really affect what you're disclosing, what you have available to disclose, what others are revealing to us when they talk. And what I want us to think about is uh, what are the disclosures, which we talked about so much in our last class, what are the disclosures that seem to matter? What are we paying attention to uh, when it comes to selecting good partners who are going to uh, allow us to feel good and comfortable and even grow and flourish in our relationships. So today we uh, begin the first of two lectures relating to chapter six, okay? It's important for you to know that there are uh, two lectures relating to chapter six. This is the first of them. Both of them will involve our discussion of how people vary, how people vary before they become relationship partners. We've already talked about two different kinds of ways that people vary. That is to say, their uh, biological sex and their orientation toward uh, um, a, a same sex and a different sex partner. Today we're going to talk about, the f we're going to begin a discussion of how people vary. How do people vary? How, think of in this room, on this campus, all the different ways that people exist in this world as individuals quite independent of what their relationship partners will be, right? People are not the same when they start relationships. We don't select people assuming everybody's the same and then just hope we make the best of it. We go into the game knowing that people do vary. And what I want to talk about today is what are the dimensions along which that variance occurs that we might want to pay attention to if we're trying to have good relationships or if we're therapists and we're trying to help clients have a good relationship or uh, if you're a divorce attorney and wondering why certain relationships aren't working out. So, how do people vary, and what are the ways in which people vary that matter so much to how relationships actually unfold? That's our question. Turns out there's some pretty good answers to it. Uh, this is a quote, you'll see this in the book if, you, uh, have written, have, if you've read uh, chapter six. It's from a guy named Lewis Terman. He was a sociologist back in the 30s. He was really famous for IQ tests, actually, Lewis Terman. So you may have seen his name, maybe in abnormal psychology, even in a developmental psychology class. But he also did a lot of work on uh, uh, marriage and couples. And I want to read this quote from uh, one of his books. I believe it was his 1938 book. And he had a very specific theory about why marriages succeed and fail. And here's what it sounded like. He said that a large proportion of incompatible marriages are so because of a predisposition to unhappiness in one or both of the spouses. Right? So it's a predisposition. It's just the way they are. It's not about the relationship. It's about who the people are, whether by nature or by nurture. I don't know how they got there, but however they got there, there are persons so lacking in the qualities which make for compatibility that they would be incapable of finding happiness in any marriage. Oh my gosh, let's avoid those people. Jeez. So this, we've, you remember we talked about social learning theory and the idea that part of what matters in our relationships is this exchange of rewards, 
right? And that we shape each other. You say something nice to me, and if I reward that, then I'm going to hear more nice things from you, right? We shape each other. We sort of um, help to create uh, um, different people. Two people in relationships help to shape and mold and create different people on the basis of what they say they like and what they say they don't like. This theoretical perspective, so that's social learning theory, this theoretical perspective says some people are just inherently rewarding. Like it's something about them. It may then feed forward into their transactions, into their conversations, but it's something about them that make them very rewarding or very punishing to have to deal with, right? So different people might enter the game with different propensities to be rewarding, to be positive, to be supportive and compassionate, and other people might take us in the opposite direction. Okay? I put a little pencil there because you can assess these kinds of things really easily with self-report questionnaires. So remember from our methods lecture, you probably all of you have taken a sort of a self-report measure of personality. These are data that are fairly easy to collect. I want to talk about a study that I did. Um, I published it in 2010 and it's been replicated a few times now in different ways. Um, I got a large group of newlywed couples, first time marriage, uh, not too long after their wedding. They came to my lab and I gave them some questionnaires. I asked them about their, uh, how, uh, a concept we call neuroticism or negative emotionality. And that is a trait-like tendency to experience and express negative emotion. Okay? That's kind of what Terman was talking about, right? Here's something else Terman might have been talking about. Just being sort of angry. A tendency to be quick to anger. Right? Another, uh, another trait that might make it difficult to have a relationship with a person is impulsivity. Sort of acting without thinking, acting without consulting other people, doing things rashly. Right? And uh, not making really good decisions. People vary in all these traits. Uh, self esteem, a tendency to see oneself in a critical, pessimistic, harsh light. Okay? So we can measure these things, takes almost no time at all to do. I then followed these couples uh, for four years. And over those four years, I could uh, identify five different groups of couples, okay? One group on the very left was either divorced or pretty miserable 48 months into their marriage. That's why there is a sad face. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum were the couples who were really happy, as happy at 48 months as they were uh, right, at, right when we saw them. Their relationship satisfaction didn't change. And then there's groups that array themselves in between. Okay. So groups that are kind of unhappy, but not as unhappy as the unhappiest group. Another group that was kind of happy, they hadn't changed so much in their satisfaction. This is group four. Um, they were stably satisfied, not quite as satisfied as group five. You get the idea, right? The details here don't matter. Lots of times the details of what I tell you don't matter, but the gist matters. And here's the gist. If you look at that group on the left side, the unhappy face group, what, the, what that uh, uh, y-axis means is how different they are from the average. Okay, these are husband's traits. So what that means is that on average, that's the line in the middle, that zero line, that's the average. Okay? Above that line, that on the very far left, you see group one, those are the people who went on to... Um, have really, they really struggled in their relationships if they didn't end. They were really unhappy or they were divorced. You can see they have higher levels of negative affectivity, higher levels of trade anger relative to the, the average, that straight line at zero, higher levels of impulsivity, and at least for husbands, uh, not especially low levels of self-esteem. Okay? Despite the fact that they were in terrible, miserable relationships with really bad personalities, somehow these guys managed to, managed to still believe in themselves. Kind of nice, huh? So at the other end of the spectrum, you've got folks who are really doing great in their relationship, low levels of neuroticism, that's the, the purple bar, low levels of anger, low levels of impulsivity, 
and a little bit above average in uh, self-esteem. Okay? Yes, question? The middle group right there in the middle? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would attribute that to measurement error. I would not make too much out of that. Okay. Uh, it is interesting that it's only when you look at the extremes, group one and group five, that the differences really pop. The ones in the middle sort of fit the pattern, but it's not perfect, right? But still, it gives you enough sense to say, enough of a sense to say, if you're above average in these uh, characteristics, it puts you on a path toward more difficult relationships. If you're below average, especially in the top three, neuroticism, trade anger, and impulsivity, chances are you're going to go on and do better. The other three are arrayed in the middle. Okay? So the idea is, Terman, there's a lot, to, a lot to believe in what Terman had to say. Let's look at the same data for the wives of these couples. Keeping in mind that husbands and wives don't always end up in the same group. Right? There are, it's possible for a wife in group, uh, group one, way there on the left, to have had a husband in group two or group three, for example. That does happen. You don't have to be in the exact same group as your partner. Um, so again, we have relationship outcomes after four years. That's groups one through five. And we have uh, uh, a difference between you and the average in this sample of people. And again, you can see that to the extent that Wives are higher in neuroticism, trade anger, and impulsivity. They're more likely to have distressed relationships. And then, as it is supposed to, uh, it flips for self-esteem. Now, these data are uh, more consistent with the story than the husband's data were. You can see that women who are low in self-esteem go on to have uh, difficult relationships. These are only averages. And as you go uh, up the spectrum toward better and better relationships over these four years, you see people with higher and higher self-esteem. Okay? Yeah? How were these traits measured as to what questions were asked? They were standard questions. Uh, so um, a neuroticism question, uh, an impulsivity question might have been something like, I tend, to think, I, I tend to act a lot without thinking too much about it. I make important decisions without any deep consideration of the consequences. That would be impulsivity. Trade anger would be, Lots of times when I find myself in traffic, I just get pissed off. Okay, I've, I've been in front of that person before, I think, on the 405. Uh, neuroticism, um, when I get upset, I tend to stay upset for a long time. Uh, I tend to be uh, pretty self-critical. I tend to be, uh, I tend to brood a lot. I'm, I'm more of a pessimistic person. Those are the kinds of questions, okay? So um, you can measure each one of these uh, concepts with five or ten items quite reliably. But the idea is traits matter. Now, here's some things we can't know. Maybe there, there are mate selection issues that uh, come into play. People aren't randomly assigned to the partners. There are, uh, there are personality traits that might affect who you end up in a relationship with, and maybe that's what makes your relationship difficult. So maybe you have this personality style, and that leads you, maybe the impulsive decision you made was to marry someone who wasn't that good for you, right? And that could be a contributor. So we don't know exactly how these traits come to determine or play a role in how your relationship unfolds, but more than one study, in fact many studies, now suggest that traits matter. There's something non-random about the traits that you have and that your partner has entering the relationship and how that's going to matter when your relationship is four years old. Okay, so then we have to ask, oh, let me show you this cartoon. Here's a therapist talking to his clients, um, uh, probably a married couple, and he says, uh, you're both miserable wretches, but I suppose that's beside the point. For Lewis Terman, that's exactly the point, right? It's not about conversation. It's not about how we talk to each other. Those might be consequences of the personality traits. But for Terman and for this trait-like view, people vary on these personality traits, and that's what matters. That is not beside the point. It is the point itself. So then we can start to wonder, especially around uh, most of the research um, 
that has been done focuses on that neuroticism concept, that negative emotionality concept, right? Um, and that is a, a, a widely replicable ph phenomenon. I want to talk a little bit about that idea, that sort of bundled together with self-esteem. And we have to wonder, how does this happen? What, and from a scientific psychological perspective, we say, what's the mechanism? What's the mediator? How does this get to here, right? And uh, a number of people, like Sandra Murray, for example, as social psychologist at the uh, University of Buffalo, um, has studied this idea. One way I like to summarize this idea is with a radiator. I don't know if you have, any of you have lived in a house with a big radiator, but um, uh, the idea is that people who have negative, higher levels of negative emotion radiate that negative emotion. It doesn't stay inside their bodies. It's, it doesn't go away quickly. Even after you turn off the radiator, even after the heat is turned off, that radiator is still pumping stuff out, right? You can still sort of feel it, and it gradually dissipates over time, but still that experience, that, that heat, is still present, right? So that's a metaphor. Let's get beyond a metaphor and try to think about this from a scientific point of view more. And the idea that um, people have explored is that people who are inclined to experience negative self-related emotions, lower self-esteem uh, and higher levels of negative affectivity, what they do, the idea is, that they project that onto their partner. They say, it's inside of me. I don't think very highly of myself. I've just indicated this on a questionnaire. And what I do is I radiate that outward. I project that onto my partner. You're my partner. I see, you see me in the way I see myself, right? It's a kind of a projection. Chapter 12, we'll get into this idea. It's actually a, a model of therapy to talk about object relations. You're an object in my psychology. I project who I am onto you. And then guess what? I respond to you not the way you really are, but the way that I've created you to be, right? So I say, gee, I, I don't feel so good about myself, or I'm, I, I brood a lot. I'm sort of more of a pessimistic person. I'm not, not such an optimistic person. I kind of think that when bad things happen, I just think that everything's going to go straight to hell, right? I tend to have that experience. Guess what? I think you think that way about me. And then I say... How dare you think that about me? That's not, why do you think I'm such a pessimistic person? And it's because I've sort of put that on you, right? And then, so, I expect others to see, uh, I would expect others to see um, me the way they see themselves, and this biases my expectations. So if I see you as a person who doesn't value me that much, if I see you as a person who um, believes that I, too, have a low sense of who I am, well, then my expectations for what you're going to do for me in this relationship aren't so great. Why aren't you nicer to me? What do you mean? Why? I, I filter your behavior through this lens that I have, which is pessimistic, critical. Why aren't you nicer to me? And I want to give you... So this is going to bias your expectations... I uh, don't have high hopes for how this relationship is going to go. Imagine starting a relationship off with a person who thinks it's not going to go so well or that it's really, I, I only think this relationship is just going to be like a lot of my previous relationships. Well, thanks, right? I, I thought I had a say in that, but I guess not, right? So this expectation, this view of the world gets sent out into the world and then the person has to deal with it in a complicated way. So here's the, here is the dependency regulation model, okay? You'll prob this comes right out of the book, and you'll probably see this on the exam. And this idea is what I was just saying, but here's the cycle. A person with this low sense of self-esteem or a pessimistic, hypercritical view of the world um, uh, leads that person to underestimate the partner's positive feelings for them, Right? So if I think you see me the same way I see myself, that's not so good. I want you to think better of me than I think of myself, right? But if I, see, I think 
that you think of me as, uh, the way I think of myself, an unpleasant person to be around. Why do you think I'm so unpleasant? I never said you were unpleasant. I know, but you were thinking it, weren't you? Right? Probably had that conversation. So whenever you say something nice to me, I sort of downgrade it. It doesn't have the same spark. It doesn't have, I don't interpret it as being sincere and genuine and really positive. And when you're negative, I might exaggerate things in the opposite direction. Okay? So I then devalue my partner. Gee, why, why, am, I a, why am I in a relationship with you if you constantly think so little of me? Right? I've put that on you, and then I say, why do you treat me that way? And you say, I don't treat you that way. That's how you perceive me treating you. Right? You've probably had those conversations with your partner. There's hints of this kind of thing happening. So it causes this person with lower levels of self-esteem to devalue the partner and to feel hurt, like, hello, how are you? To feel hurt and neglected, right? And to express their discontent. Why don't you treat me better? Wait a minute, I treat you just fine. Every time I say something nice to you, you dismiss it, you ignore it. And every time I say something uh, remotely critical of you, it's like the, the, you know, the world is going to open up underneath you and engulf you. Like, what's up with that? And so as a result of that, this thing that I sort of throw onto you and then I deal with, it leads me to be pessimistic about our relationship. Gee, why, we keep fighting all the time, even though I'm the one who's generating all the fights. The partner then says, wow, this is taking a lot of work, right? So the person on the receiving end of this has to take in these messages that are uh, disproportionately negative compared to somebody who would be lower on these traits, right? There's a lot of it. So the person on the receiving end is doing a lot of work and saying, actually, no, what I meant to say was this, or I, I didn't quite say it that way, or no, seriously, I really do care for you. I think you're over, overreacting here, right? And so what happens is, the person with lower levels of self-esteem or higher levels of negative emotionality end up saying, wow, this, I, I don't think you like me, which is basically them saying, I kind of don't like myself and I'm going to throw that on you. And the person on the receiving end of that says, wow, this is a lot of work. Like, I'm not getting a lot of attention in this relationship. I'm just sort of defending the nice things that I'm saying to you and that's kind of crazy. Like, I don't, I don't get that. So as a result, um, the, it creates distress in relationships and it reinforces in the next relationship this idea that, hey, I'm not so good at relationships or it's really hard to be in relationships with other people. Now, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, in the social sciences, these effects aren't deterministic, right? They're not true, unambiguous causes. Plenty of relationships with people high in negative emotionality have great relationships. They learn how to talk about it. They learn how to label it. They say, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I just need to say it. And then the partner says, it does sound kinda crazy, and I really do love you, and this is that thing that you go through, isn't it? This is the dependency regulation thing, isn't it? Right, that's what that is. And they go, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, I get it. Right, right, right. Right, so there are ways around that. There are workarounds, right? So it's not as though that this is a, you know, a, a, a sure route to having a distressed relationship. It increases the likelihood that a relationship will have to deal with these issues. But you could imagine somebody who had these traits who had um, a very low stress life, for example. Right? If they're not spending a lot of time on the 405, if they have a boss who loves them, if they're independently wealthy and don't have a boss, if they have children or don't have wonderful children or no children at all, that's going to take a little bit of the, the flame out of this uh, equation, right? It's not, it's not such a hot experience anymore. It's like, oh, this isn't going to happen so much. It's, it's not as likely to occur. My point is, this is a true phenomenon. I believe it does work, and the evidence tends to support that fact. But it's not a deterministic. If you, have, uh, if you tend to be a pessimistic, brooding person, you can still have plenty fantastic relationships, but it sure helps to know that part of what you're doing when you're talking to your partner is you're putting something of yourself on them. Question there. Why does it turn dependency regulation? That's part of a, part of a more general um, model of how relationships work 
And it stems from our discussion of social exchange theory. Remember we were talking about social exchange theory uh, and when we were talking about our definitional criteria of relationships, we talked about interdependence, right? We talked about uh, this idea that what we're doing in our relationships is really kind of navigating these invisible bonds that connect us with our partner. And you can see that this is a, a one version of how that interdependence can play out. And uh, there are other versions of interdependence, uh, other ways of regulating our dependence where people find ways to stay close and be close, etc. So it's... Uh, this theoretical perspective assumes that a big part of what we're doing in our relationships is sort of constantly thinking about how close we are to our partner, maybe not even consciously thinking, how close we are to our partner relative to how close we want to be to our partner. So we all vary in how much closeness we want in our partners, how much closeness we want in our relationships. We may even vary over the course of a day of how much closeness we want with our partner, right? And that is a, an experience that we have uh, that we're constantly monitoring and paying attention to, trying to get closer when we need that, trying to distance ourselves when we want to sort of get a little solace and time to ourselves. And the interesting thing is that our partner is doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, right? So it's both of us sort of moving toward, in a way, our own internal standards for the closeness that we hope to be getting from our relationship, right? So you might have been, maybe you've been in a relationship or you know relationships where um, your partner really wanted a lot more closeness than you, or you really wanted a, a lot less closeness than you. That's the one that actually gets our attention more, right? Your partner wants, to, wants a little more distance. And what's interesting about that is it sort of takes a while for us to understand that, oh, my partner needs some downtime. Like, that's how they regulate. That's how they sort of um, uh, pull back a little bit, uh, recognize that maybe they're going through one of these cycles where they say, oh, that's just me sort of projecting my stuff onto my partner, and they need to pull back, and that's sort of nurturing. They're taking care of themselves. They're uh, making sure that they come back to the relationship in a healthier way. So uh, that's a, uh, probably too long an answer of why it's called the dependency regulation model. But in our relationships, we are uh, really uh, very consistently and, and constantly paying attention to how close we are and how close we want to be. So even better than that figure, I think, is this cartoon uh, um, by uh, Darren Bell. It's uh, one of my favorite uh, comics in the uh, newspaper every day. Uh, and this is called Canderville. And that guy on the left is uh, Lamont, and he's a writer. And, uh, he's, uh, and Susan is not really his girlfriend, but it's clearly a love interest in this, uh, in this comic strip. And he says, uh, okay, Susan's going to tell me that the story that I wrote is really bad. Okay? So automatically saying, oh, I, I, here's something that I'm proud of. I'm going to give it to you, and oh, shit, I know that she, it's, just, it's just not that good. I should have worked harder on it, right? So he gives it to her, and she's looking at it, and she's looking at him. And then, she's, then he says, oh, it's, it's not just bad. It's awful. It's really terrible, right? And this is that cycle. This is the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to project onto you what I think of myself and my work, and then I'm going to have to deal with you being critical of my work, even though you're not critical of my work. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and then she says, Lamont, I have to tell you, this is pretty good. This might be the best story I've ever read. And he says, oh, it's worse than I thought. It's even worse than that. She's trying to spare my feelings. She thinks I'm so fragile that she has to praise me instead of being honest with me. Right? That's the phenomenon. And the interesting part is uh, Susan's reaction here, right? Which is, wait a minute. Why did my praise just get downregulated to being criticism? That doesn't feel good. So this is that idea. This is that idea uh, that uh, the positive thing. So there's the the experience of low self-esteem that that uh, Lamont suffers from. He underestimates uh, her positive uh, evaluation of his work. Uh, he then he doesn't really in this cartoon devalue her. He doesn't say, "Oh, you're a bad person for not understanding my quirky and you know amazing writing," which is possible. 
Um, but then uh, she's the one who says, wow, I have to do a lot of work in this relationship. I thought it would just be enough to say, this is amazing and you're an amazing writer, but now you don't believe that. It doesn't sink in, right? And there's some more recent research happening now that uh, says that people who do have um, uh, lower levels of self-esteem or slightly higher levels of negative emotionality actually can learn to self-affirm. They can say, okay, here's how I need to get outside of this dysfunctional loop. I can actually tell myself that everything's going to be okay. I can figure out strategies to remind myself that I'm doing this. And there's good experimental research indicating that that really does offset the effects of these kinds of cycles. But the cycles, I believe, are um, uh, real and I do believe uh, govern uh, uh, some dimension of how we uh, uh, manage closeness with our partner and what makes it difficult for our partners to manage us. Okay, so there's a lot to like in what Terman says. There, uh, w there are differences amongst all of us, and those differences have some effect on how relationships are going to unfold. You might get curious about how that happens, but Terman's point was there are people with a predisposition to unhappiness that make them difficult relationship partners. Not impossible, I think he overstated the case, but still, there's truth to this trait-based view. But that's not the only way that we differ, right? We differ in other ways. We differ uh, on the basis of how we were reared. We're, we differ in how our families uh, were uh, uh, managed and uh, created and um, developed while we were younger. So it's not just that we have personality traits. We do. Um, but a lot of people who um, uh, conduct therapy, for example, reject the trait-based view. They get it, but they say, that's not really where the depth of people's emotional lives are. I get it, that's sort of a superficial, quick way that we can assess people and know how they're similar and how they're different. But what I want to talk to, some therapists might say, or some people who uh, sort of reject a trait-based view, they say people differ, but the way they differ has so much more to do with how their parents treated them, the kind of caregiving relationship that they may have had. And usually, this takes us down the, the path of attachment, right? We think a lot about, oh, that's the attachment model. And you're right, it is. And on, Thursday, on Tuesday of next week, we'll talk a lot about only attachment and the different ways um, relationships researchers have uh, studied attachment. But for now, I want to sort of connect the trait-based view with the attachment view. And in the middle, I want to talk a little bit about families and what happens in families. And when people ask this question, what's the, what's the, the relevance, what's the bearing of our family experiences on who we are as relationship partners? Uh, people tend to say, well, what, what functions do families serve to begin with? What do families afford us? What do they do for us anyway? Families provide us with shelter, they provide us with comfort. Uh, it takes us a long time to reach a stage where we're fully autonomous, able to go out into the world and survive on our own. Uh, and so our families sort of provide us with a lot of resources, emotional resources, physical resources, that allow us to get through that early developmental period and um, uh, really move out into the world uh, eventually on our own. So we ask, you know, what, fa what functions do families serve? And then what happens when those functions change a little bit? What happens when uh, you have a really uh, nurturing family, but then one of your parents is lost for whatever reason, maybe due to death or depression or having to go for a long-term stay in the military or having to go to prison or anything? You know, what happens when the bonds that we have with our caregivers and that we need so much from our caregivers, what happens when those change? What happens? And there are a lot of ways of thinking about that. Um, and I want to focus on one, the one that really gets the most attention. And that is what happens when families end. If you're in a class on relationships, you really have to have a, I hope, a sophisticated understanding of 
what it means when people end their relationships. What are the consequences of relationship dissolution? Okay, how does that work? And it's a, an issue that's in the news a lot. On Time Magazine, for example, it says, you know, what, does, what divorce does to kids? New research says the long-term damage is worse than you thought. Should unhappy parents stay hitched? And uh, I think if we were to survey this room and we were to say, how many of you have parents who divorced or who have friends whose parents who have divorced or who have aunts and uncles who have divorced? How many is that? Yes, everybody, right? So this happens, and we have to have an understanding of what it means when this happens. We have to be smart about this because this really does represent a rupture in how families function. We have to understand what that means. Is it really the case that long-term damage is worse than, than we thought? Is that true? We have to know that. And we have to be smarter than the people who write these headlines, right? We have to be the people who say, wait a minute, based on the research methods that I know about, how are we going to understand this? What's a smart perspective on this? Do we really want everybody to stay, even if they're, uh, even if they're unhappy? Should unhappy parents stay hitched? Well, it's interesting that when you look in the literature, and you'll see this in chapter 6, uh, when we entertain this question of whether divorce or uh, relationship dissolution uh, affects child well-being, what's interesting, one thing is interesting, is that um, it's not just divorce that affects children. Um, lots of relationships end without actually being formalized in divorce, but leaving that small wrinkle aside, we have to ask this question, and there are some distinct perspectives on the answer to that question. One of them uh, uh, adopted by Judith Wallerstein there on the top, um, uh, and she wrote a book called uh, The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. You can barely see it there, but it says the 25-year landmark study. This is probably the basis of that Time Magazine article. And she says, yeah, this is a problem. The answer to that question, does divorce affect child well-being, is yes, in terrible ways, long-term, hidden, subtle ways. But Mavis Hetherington, that person on the right side there, uh, the bottom right corner, wrote a book called For Better or For Worse, Divorce Reconsidered, where she said it's actually a little more subtle than that. What I need you to know about these two people, uh, and there's a special focus box in Chapter 6 about them, is that they used different research methods. Uh, Judith Wallerstein did clinical interviews with people. She's a practitioner in Northern California. Uh, did clinical interviews with people, but didn't really have a control group. Judith, uh, um, uh, Mavis Hetherington, there on the bottom right. By the way, do I care that, I, that you know their names? No, I don't care that you know their names. I, I don't care. But I want you to know that there are diverse perspectives on the answer to this really important question. That's what I care that you know about. And I want you to know the answer to this question. Which one is right? Is it the, yes, these are devastating long-term consequences, and maybe parents should really stay in miserable relationships. Maybe that's for the betterment of their children. But I also want you to really appreciate the Mavis Hetherington perspective here, which is that there's some subtleties here that really matter. And when you collect the proper data, you start to see not just the black and white, do this, don't do this. You start to see the gradations in between the two extremes. So here is, the, here is um, uh, some of the substance of Judith Wallerstein's um, perspective. And I depict this as a glass half empty point of view, which is that this is a pessimistic view of uh, what uh, divorce affords people. Uh, I think correctly, she notes that poverty for women and children uh, uh, grow as uh, economic resources typically decline. One of the true facts about divorce is A, lawyers get a lot of money. Divorce is really good for the economy, it turns out. Uh, and B, uh, you often, not always, but often separate one household into two households usually with not a huge in increase in income, right? So you've got a family that has a certain amount of resources, a certain percent goes to attorneys, and then the rest has to get divided into two households instead of one, okay? You just have less money. 
You just had le less money. And in fact, divorce, at least in the short term, and I think I've said this previously in this class, divorce is one of the causes of poverty in the United States. People often get out of it. It's like a short-term blow to the financial well-being of the family. People sort of move out of it, but you do take a hit financially uh, when uh, divorce happens. Divorce, uh, according to Wallerstein, creates emotional difficulties in parents and children. So uh, it's not at all unusual to feel really anxious, really depressed, to really wonder about uh, what future relationships hold in store for you if you are either a child or a parent who, is, who has gone through the, uh, the painful ending of a relationship. It might also be the case that because the child is um, shuttling back and forth between two parents, both of whom really love each other, love, love the child. You know, there's, there can be very good parent-child relationships, but the child is now between the two parents, and that can lead to the parents um, sort of directing some of the emotions that they're feeling onto the child. Right? Now the child is sort of the, the bearer of those difficult experiences. And I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong in the midst of this. I'm just saying that these are real experiences that people have. And if you go on to become a therapist, if you go on to uh, become a teacher where you're dealing with families, working with families, you'll see these, these experiences unfold and they are uh, emotional, they are difficult, and they are uh, quite real. And Wallerstein makes the point that, uh, as a rough estimate, divorce doubles the risk of adverse outcomes among children. Doubling the risk. That's something we should pay attention to, right? But let me ask you a question. Do you have a question? Uh, the third bullet point with the board Yeah. Was that like a before and after, or is that just a correlation? That is uh, more likely to be a correlation. So that is not a perfect experimental piece of data. Yeah. Uh, because the possibility could be that you have uh, a person who is dealing with a lot of stress ends up, and ends up sort of disrupting their relationship because they don't manage, regulate those emotions well, and it just so happens that they're also not so well regulated as a parent with their child. So um, in many of these studies, it's quite difficult to pull out cause and effect. But uh, this last point is probably one you're going to see on the exam, so I want, I, want you to make, I want to make sure that I get it to you straight. Imagine if I said, uh, I will double, I will double however much money you have in your wallet. He has a dollar in his wallet. It just seemed like I'm the most generous guy in the, war, in the world, but I've given him change from my couch. But this person, she's got, she just got paid a thousand dollars. Now I'm out a thousand dollars. Right? Do you have a thousand dollars? Is that what you have in your wallet? She does. She has a thousand. <laughs> so I've just doubled. That, that was doubling. Both times it was doubling. But it's totally different. It's a totally different number, right? Doubling a small number, we could all do that. Doubling a big number, it's a bigger deal. So we have to ask, what's the number that we're doubling? What's the doubling? Is it 1%? So what's the risk that uh, children are having adverse outcomes? Is it 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%? Or is it 50%? If it doubles from 50% of the kids whose parents don't get divorced have problems, and then it doubles so that every child of divorce has problems, oh my gosh, then the Time Magazine cover is correct. Right? But if it's a small number, then the Time Magazine cover is uh, totally out of line. It's like uh, just uh, on there to sell, news, to sell magazines, right? It turns out that that number, this is very imprecise, it turns out that that number is probably 15%, okay? If you read a bunch of research articles, if you look at a bunch of studies, it's not a huge number. And here's what I mean. 50, it's more like the small wallet than the big wallet is really the point. In a diverse set of marriages that remain intact, maybe 15% of those kids are going to have problems at school, problems re relating to other kids, 
They might have internalizing problems like depression, depressive symptoms. They might act out and be aggressive. That number probably goes up to about 30%. Very rough, very rough number, right? This is not a number you want to um, you want to put too much stock into. But what that means is that the vast majority of kids, the vast majority of kids who go through a divorce, maybe 70 percent, end up doing just fine. Okay, so don't lose sight of what that doubling means. Okay, yeah. Well, the question is, does this sort of take into account who the kids are to begin with in any way and even in a genetic way, right? Then we'd have to think about that question as, should that be more or less true for people who remain intact versus divorced? Uh, it's a hard question to answer. Um, it, the short answer is, it does not take that into account. So that might be built into the doubling. So there may be people who, uh, to the extent that some of the variability in our personality traits is heritable, and it is, part of our personality is heritable from our parents, that that might create certain sets of families that have more genetic risk, and that that sort of all plays out in, in a, an environment that is a little more heated, an environment that doesn't come back down to baseline really quickly, or even if there are, um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of times we think that all of the action has to be between the two partners, but we can have genetic predispositions to not being really great in the workforce, right? So there can be people who, guess what? Um, you know, a propensity to drink alcohol and to find alcohol rewarding has a genetic basis to it, right? So you might have that genetic risk and then have a, a record of absenteeism in the workplace that reduces your income stream or that creates economic instability. And it's a, a risk factor that indirectly affects the family, even if it doesn't necessarily affect the interplay between the two partners, right? So um, there are likely to be uh, higher levels of risky genetic loading in certain sorts of families and then others that will play themselves out in complicated ways. So the key point, though, is that there is this doubling, the, the wallet issue, but that the mass, vast majority of kids in uh, divorced uh, families end up doing fine. Yeah? Uh, is there any work done to sort out the directionality issue for that doubling? So, you know, if you have a kid, excuse me, so if you have a kid who is going down the path of having an adverse outcome that puts more stress on the parent. Yes, right. Positive right. Uh, yes, that, there is work on that, exactly that. Again, it's correlational, right? So we can't really know uh, what, what's driving what. You can't do an experiment and sort of create a difficult child for one set of parents and then set, send them home and you know, have that family erupt and then have another angelic child go into another home. However, there are really interesting studies. This is uh, a little bit off topic. There are really interesting studies um, of how different kinds of parents respond to different kinds of kids. And uh, just think about that. Different kinds of kids interacting with different kinds of parents. So you get a, uh, like a mom. Let's say you have a mom, and you've got a child, and you teach that child uh, how to be really, really sweet. So they're going to do some task together, like they have to solve some complicated, frustrating puzzle together. And what these researchers will do is they'll say, OK, with this mom, I want you to be as sweet as you can. Whenever she suggests something, say, do you mean here? Should I put the puzzle piece here? Is that a good idea? And the mom says, yes, that's a great idea. That's the perfect thing to do, right? And so that child is like perfect at doing this task. And then that same child, the exact same kid, is taught to be a little bastard. Like, whenever the mom says something to you, go untie her shoe. Like, that's what you should do. Whatever she says anything to you, sort of flick something into her hair, right? And so the, the idea is how do you experimentally test how well certain people with certain kinds of backgrounds do respond to certain kinds of kids. So you might imagine that that does matter. How old are the children? Quite a range. Uh, 
And I don't have the newest data at my fingertips, but I think the question you're leading to is, does that matter? What's your hunch? What's your hunch on that? Is it better to have your parents divorce when you're really young? So it's sort of like, yeah, whatever. I barely knew that guy anyway. <laughs> or is it better to wait until you're 14 or 15 when you have a way of understanding that, when, you're, when your parents can explain that to you? Yeah, you grow up without it, and so it becomes a little more ordinary. Yeah. I think there, you know, there's no one way for it to be good or bad, but uh, child age and, um, you know, two children at the, who you study at the age of 20, one who's been away from, let's say, his father for 18 years, is really different from a child who's been away from their father for three years, right? Those are different kids. They've grown up in different circumstances. So, so those are some of the different parts of this puzzle that have to get uh, disentangled. Yeah, question? So the point is, like, our children scared? Scarred, yeah. Our children scarred, right? That was what I was getting to. 20 years later, when they, when they feel they are, it's not kind of like dismissing their feelings. Like, that's not validating. Like, who is this woman to say, like, that they're feeling like, no, you're not actually fine. Like, you're Yeah, it's a good question. So if you ask kids, how uh, do you struggle in relationships, right? Kids who, um, uh, whose parents are intact struggle in relationships, right? It happens, right? I, I mean, just think, if you had a, uh, if your parents never divorced, if that's true of you, have you ever had a relationship that didn't go the way you thought it should? Maybe it got more aggressive than you wanted to. Maybe there, was, there were struggles and tensions, right? That happens. When people who come from uh, divorced parents are asked the same question, they say, yes, I've had those experiences, and it's because my parents ended their relationship, right? So it becomes an explanation that may not necessarily be an accurate explanation. And that's what a control group does for us. That's not to say that some kids really are scarred and it's really directly related to that experience. I believe that's true. But the point of this is to say relationships are hard. Relationships are hard. They're hard for everybody, even with people who have fantastic family backgrounds, right? And you have to sort of adjust for that percentage when you also study the group of people who have parents who've divorced. So that's what that point is. But I think you're absolutely right, which is um, there are people who um, grow up and you know, grow up into adulthood and say, wow, that, that was a big deal for me to get over. Like they're, they're, it's not just that they're having difficulties in their current relationships. They're having difficulties with their mom or their dad. And it's really direct, it feels really directly related to that. So I think you're right about that. Yeah. I was just wondering how much of the 15 to 30 percent increase might be accounted for by the fact that they're moving into poverty because poverty tends to Yes, right. So other things come along with it. There's a couple really interesting things that we have to recognize when we're talking about the change in sort of the adult, adult constellation in a family. One of them is that divorce isn't an event, right? I've known people who've divorced. I have family members who have divorced. I have friends who've divorced. And what you realize is it's not like January 1st, like, oh, it's a new day, like December 31st ended, and it's 2015, like, it's a brand new thing. Guess what? It takes years and years and years, right? There's heterogeneity in that experience. For some people, it's, there's no children involved, the relationship wasn't very long, and it ends. And for other people, it's long, and it's drawn, drawn out, and it's complicated, and it sort of creates even more pain, right? The divorce creates even more pain than the relationship dis dissolution itself. Um, but along similar, so we, there are a lot of factors that come into play, and the point being made is that um, to the extent that uh, financial resources start to dwindle, that can also be a source of, of uh, adverse outcomes for children, right? So now medical care may not be as good as it was, or now the child who needed a tutor to get through their math class 
uh, do doesn't have a parent who can pay for the tutor, right? And so now that child is feeling stressed at school. And now the parents have to deal with the stress of the child not being able to do so well in uh, that math class, and now they start to blame each other, right? So uh, there are many, many factors that come into play here, and they tend to feed, e feed off each other, and they really require people to work very hard to manage the uh, sort of the strong negative emotions that um, all of these changes uh, instigate in their lives. So Hetherington's point, uh, more optimistic with regard to the effects of divorce on kids, is that divorce can have a lot of effects. We could probably all imagine um, divorces that were hard at the time, but probably a good decision, right? And so there, because there is such heterogeneity in how relationships end, how marriages end, it also means that there are heterogeneity on, on the children themselves. And so um, there are some divorces where the parents really handle it well. And they really, uh, there's a term for this, it's called co-parenting, right? So it's the idea that we, we have a, a, a dimension of our relationship that is our adult relationship. It's our marriage. But there's another dimension to our relationship, which isn't you in relation to me and vice versa. It's us in relation to raising our children. And if parents can sort of team up and say, okay, let's put all of that stuff aside, this is about our children, and let's not let anything get in the way of that. When people are able to make that separation, then the effects of the, on the child are really diminished, right? Because now the child says, I get it, I understand, you guys didn't work it out, it's still hard for me, I really wish you were still together, that's really what I want, um, but I get it, I understand, and you're helping me to understand this on an emotional level. And then when the handoffs occur, you know, when the child is shuttled off between the the two parents, the child doesn't get all aroused emotionally. The child's able to sleep well in both places, eat well in both places, uh, succeed in school, have good friends. So there's a lot of variety in how uh, relationships end. And in the midst of that, people can shift away from what is um, the, the forces that drive them apart as partners but that can still allow them to be effective parents. Those are two really different dimensions in our lives. They're hard to separate out, right, when you're just leaving a relationship with a person who maybe betrayed you in some significant way or uh, you know, has done some bad things that lead you to feel uh, very conflicted about your relationship with them. But we do really, if you have a child, you really have an obligation to try to pull yourself away from very, easier said than done, these strong negative emotions and sort of join around your child to promote your child's well-being. Uh, it's also the case that women typically adjust a little bit better than men because they're, they tend to have better support uh, networks. So those are some important ideas. And again, just like in our conversation about uh, how men and women are similar and different, and we talked about the you know, different ways of understanding how men and women orient to the world and how much plasticity there, there is around those basic um, uh, ways of orienting to the world, the hierarchical uh, 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 orientation that men tend to have and the horizontal relationships that women tend to have. Now we're seeing, again, some gray area around how to understand the effects of divorce on children, right? It's, it's more complicated than what you can put on the cover of a magazine. So is divorce just bad? And is that the end of the story? Like there's, there's really some uh, turmoil that is likely to happen. Well, what's interesting is, um, and this gets back to the question that was being raised a moment ago, what's interesting is that if you do a study, uh, let's say a longitudinal study, this is a study that I'm talking about, not that you need to know, uh, but it was a study in the UK of people, not who are in the divorce process, but it was a study of every child born in the UK within a certain span of time. So it was a large number of kids, and it was just what we would think of as a prospective longitudinal study, right? So when the child was born, they started collecting data on these kids, they started collecting data on the parents, and as time unfolded, uh, every year or so, they kept collecting more data. And as time passed, 
Some of those marriages ended, and some of those marriages remained intact, right? What the researchers are able to do is go back before the divorce even happened, right? So now you've got the data already in your data file of those kids who went on to divorce, even though you had no inkling that that was going to happen, right? So they're all intact. And then you say, oh, let me now check out two years before the divorce or when the kids were 16 or whatever it is, let me now check out the kids who, whose parents went on to divorce and who remain intact. Well, guess what? They are already having problems, okay? The problems have, it's not divorce that causes the problems, right? The problems can be unfolding long before the divorce ever makes it to the horizon, right? So uh, here is what Churlin and his col Andrew Churlin and his colleagues wrote in 1991. At least as much attention needs to be paid to the processes that occur in troubled intact families, so they're troubled and intact before they end, we have to have a way of understanding. We have to have a way of, a way of not just getting uh, uh, up on a soapbox and say, don't divorce, it's bad for your kids. We have to have a society, we have to have a culture that says, when you are struggling in your marriage, which does happen a lot, here are the resources. Here we, here, here's where you can go to get the right interventions. Here's where you can go to sort of, maybe you are going to move through a divorce, but you should have the best divorce possible. Or maybe you're not sure, and we want to try to provide services that help stabilize your relationship and help you, communicate, help you to communicate better. We'll talk about exactly what those interventions are in Chapter 12. But the idea is that we can't just say, don't divorce. We have to say, here's what we can do to promote the welfare of families. And we need uh, psychologists to do that. We need good teachers to do that. We need policies. We need good daycare centers to take the pressure off parents. There's a lot of things. It takes a lot of forces to really uh, enable families to be strong. OK. So a lot of what, so you get that point, right? So the, the, the evidence that relationships are going to exert an effect on a child are manifest not just after the divorce happens, but before the divorce happens. And we should be attuned to those challenges, the, the tumult that is existing within those families, and try to find ways to help those families, right? That's a better way of thinking about it, or at least a, a more complete way of thinking about it, I should say. OK, so that is about parental divorce, parental relationship functioning, and how the kids usually end up doing. Right? But we want to ask a, a slightly different question as well. And that is, what are the effects not just a, of a divorce and relationship um, trauma, relationship difficulties on a developing child, but are there effects later in life as well? Okay? You could imagine that everything we just said still holds, which is it varies dramatically. It varies profoundly, right? Because maybe it really was the best thing for both of your parents, uh, both of my parents, to end their relationship. They both found new partners, or my dad found a new partner, my mom is not that interested in finding a new partner. They're both in a better place. That might be a pretty good resolution, even though there was a, a relationship dissolution that was quite difficult in the midst of that, right? But we can, so there's going to be variety. That is just a rule. There's going to be heterogeneity in how these things unfold. Um, but we can also ask, is there any evidence that um, children whose parents end their relationship do substantially better or worse in their own relationships? And again, there's variety. But there is evidence that there's a, a link. So there is, what we, and that's why I've got a chain here. There's intergenerational continuity. It's not perfect prediction, far from it. But it's not random either. There's some evidence that people who um, struggled in their families when they were growing up don't have the same reference points that they might need as they are creating relationships of their own in adulthood. It's far from a perfect correlation. If you or someone close to you uh, grew up in a fam uh, with uh, single, uh, parents who had divorced, uh, that is... Uh, um, not a, a huge problem in, the, in any grand scheme is that a problem. But if you are aware of it 
it helps you to say, oh, this is a possibility. And maybe I can use that to be stronger. Maybe that's, it's an experience that I had. Irrefutably, that's true. And I wonder if that's a way that I can get to know myself better or help my partner uh, navigate me and my emotional world better. Or if I know my partner has been through this and I see them interacting with me, communicating in certain ways, and instead of just getting on their case about that, maybe that's an open window to say, oh, maybe I should be a little compassionate here because I get that that background could matter, right? So parental discord increases the risk of discord in the next generation. Increases. Again, is it you know, uh, putting another dollar in somebody's wallet? Or is it putting $1,000 in somebody's wallet? What is the increase? It's not huge, but it's not trivial either. And as smart people, we want to pay attention to it. So what do we know uh, when parents are, uh, have uh, difficult relationships? One is that the kids make a faster transition into adulthood. They sort of take on more autonomy. They tend to be kind of independent. Does that ring any bells with anybody? Like, have you known like a 12-year-old kid that you went to uh, high school with who was like driving cars or something. Like, you know, that, 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 it's that kind of thing. Uh, I'm joking, by the way. That, that was a total joke. Um, but that's the idea is that, oh, right, this is the child who on the way home from school picks up groceries for the family. Wow. Okay, that happens. It does happen. Um, uh, less, uh, parents are just less, just like they have less money, they also have less attention. Part of the good thing about being in a good relationship is you can sort of use a zone defense when you're raising your kids, right? You take them now, I'll take them now. You can get some work done, I can get some work done. You can go do X, I'll do Y. Like there's an efficiency of scale that comes from two people working on the same project together. When those two people are now working on different projects, that efficiency of scale is lost, right? So that results in less monitoring. So there was a study, I don't know if it's still true, uh, if the phenomenon is real but uh, currently, but um, you know, children whose parents divorced ended up watching a lot more television than children whose parents didn't divorce. Right? They, they were just sort of put in a, aside and they would watch a lot of TV. Um, kids watch so, so much TV now that it's probably not true anymore. Uh, there, there are weaker family relationships almost necessarily. So. Uh, the children often feel much closer to one parent than the other. It takes extra work to incorporate that other parent into the uh, family relationship and into one's uh, own relationships as they grow into adulthood. There's a little evidence that children who have gone through a divorce actually see that that's a legitimate way to end a relationship, right? So they say, yeah, it really sort of was the right thing for my parents to do, so I'm more inclined to consider that as an option in my own relationship. So that helps to explain why th this, this chain has links in it. So if one end of the chain is my relationships go a certain way and it's related to how my parents' relationships went, that part of that might be related to this greater tolerance of ending relationships when they're not going well. And that may very well be uh, a healthy um, outcome in many instances. Uh, we talked about fewer resources. So even in adulthood, uh, children of divorce accumulate less wealth, uh, as do their parents. And uh, the final idea that I want to leave you with today is this slide, which uh, is in the textbook. You'll probably see it on the exam. It was published by my uh, colleague in Australia, Kim Halford, at the University of, who's currently at the University of Queensland. And very simple study. Um, I would bring young couples into my lab, Kim would. Uh, he would uh, ask them whether their parents were divorced or not, and he would videotape them and then code their conversations, right? So he would videotape them having a problem-solving di discussion for 15 minutes. And then he would code things like disagreement. How much of the time in this, real, what is the dependence? Yeah, how much of the time, so of all of the things you say, uh, what are the percent of them that are disagreement, right? What, are the per what percent of the time are you invalidating something that your partner says? And how much are you engaging in negative listening? Does anybody know what negative listening is? Negative listening, this is really interesting. Uh, and it was really valuable for me to read this uh, research article because I learned that I used to do this a lot. 
Uh, neg negative listening is when uh, your partner is talking and you're going like that. Like, uh, this is total bullshit. Like, why? <laughs> I don't even want to be in this room right now. But I'm not saying anything, right? It's just all nonverbal. Whatever you're saying, I'm not listening to. Uh, and, you know, I doubt every word coming out of your mouth. So, uh, as opposed to active listening, which is, hmm, I, I'm, I get it. Like, I, you have a legitimate point of view. Instead of sort of generating your defense, like you've probably been in arguments where you do this, where your partner's saying something, and I'm thinking, well, how can I defend myself? What's the best counter-argument, like you're an attorney or something? What's the best counter-argument right here? Uh, whereas active listening is, how can I find something to agree with in my partner, what my partner's saying? What's, what's the point of agreement? Well, how can we sort of team up and each get what we need from this? That's a sort of a, a better learning, uh, listening strategy that gets you to a better solution or uh, at least some greater opportunity for compromise at the end of a discussion. Anyway, independent variable, whether or not the parents had divorced, dependent variable, uh, observe behavior, okay? The women here are in orange, and the darker orange bars reflect the behavior of the people whose parents had divorced. The lighter orange bars ha are the people who were raised in intact families, keeping in mind that intact families can be really happy or really unhappy, right? So you can see, and then it's uh, also the case for men, the gray and the, uh, the, the lighter and darker gray bars. You can see um, that women engage in general in uh, more disagreement and invalidation. Uh, the women tend to be a little more negative in most marital communication data, either by their own report or as we observe them. <clears throat> Not that that's, that's not the point of this slide. The point of this slide is there are <laughs> I mean, no, it's really not. <laughs> that's a gender issue, and we're, we'll talk about that in the uh, chapter eight. That's a conflict issue. Um, uh, the, the point is really that um, when you're looking at different groups of women, that the women who have uh, a divorce history are more likely to engage in disagreement than those without that history, they're more likely to engage in invalidation than women without that history. They're more likely to engage in that negative listening than women without that history, right? And the, the same is true, maybe not to the exact same degree, for, um, for men. Now, the last thought I want to leave you with, that's sort of important. You might see that on the exam, okay? That there are really behavioral manifestations of who your partner is and who you are that you and I could see in a videotape as a result of this background. The idea being that when we think about the functions that families serve, and when you think about the families that you're going to go on and create, what you're doing is you're creating a context in which children learn how to be in relationships, right? It's part of the social learning model. This is what people learn about how to regulate their own emotions, how to behave in the midst of uh, discussions where someone disagrees with what you're saying. We're shaped when we're younger, not just when we're in relationships, and I think this is a reflection of that learning process. So let's stop there. Thanks for your attention. Have great weekends, and I'll see you 